Um, my name is Peter Gray. I'm the co-founder of Scarlet Imprint, which is a talismanic esoteric publisher. Um, I've been into magic since my 20s um, because I couldn't find a better explanation for the phenomena that I was encountering in my work. And uh, it's, it's grown since then into <laughs> yeah. a monster. Yeah, and you've actually started your own um, book company now, haven't you? Uh, how did that kind of come about? Well, um, my background's in, in journalism, mm -hmm. so I was primarily working as a writer and as an editor. And uh, I wrote my first book, The Red Goddess, and there were no publishing companies out there who could publish the book in the way I wanted. Mm -hmm. So in order to gain complete magical control over the process in terms of materials, typography, numbers, um, launch date, astrologically, all of these kind of important magical factors, uh, I, I foolishly decided that the best thing to do was to, to found a publishing company to do it. Yeah, because the books are always very, um, they're kind of specific, aren't they? Sure. Um, they are a very kind of... Uh, sometimes grandiose kind of looks to them and yeah. sort of uh, yeah. was that very intentional? Well the, the books are all talismanic so probably the clearest the clearest previous example of that would have been the way that Crowley for example approached publishing but publishing the equinox especially. Um, the equinox and all of his editions he looked mm. very much at the materials that he was involved in when he was publishing it and how many he was publishing but Crowley was largely informed by the, the erotic presses, mm -hmm. rather than a particular magical sensibility. Mm -hmm. um, what we do when we work with a title is every single aspect of the book is considered magically. Mm -hmm. So the, the creation of a book is the creation of a talismanic object. Mm -hmm. So the, the colour, the design, the margins, the typography, the date of the typeface that we're using, the way in which the pages are lay out, laid out, mm -hmm. uh, the way in which all the seals are drawn, everything is designed to function magically. Um, myself talking on, um, talking on Lucifer, and in particular the magical pact as found in, in three of the grimoires mm -hmm. from the Bibliotheque Blur period, the Red Dragon, the Black Dragon, um, the Red Dragon is also the Grand Grimoire, and the Grimorian Verum, and looking at how there is a, a deep shamanic root to the practices which are involved in our magic, and how we can reconnect with that and reconnect with that spirit, rather than the, the shorthand pop culture ideas of who or what Lucifer is. Mm -hmm. Lucifer is summoned in one key ritual I've been fascinated by and that plays out in variance through all the grimoires in the summoning of spirit and the making of pact. Red Dragon advises us that this is dangerous work and counsels that we purchase a bloodstone from an apothecary and carry it with us at all times. Perhaps even in Brighton, you might have problems buying a bloodstone in an apothecary. Um, anyway, this is a bloodstone. This is a large chunk of bloodstone being used to uh, stir my martini today. Bloodstone was used particularly to staunch bleeding in the Middle Ages, and uh, it was used throughout Europe and India. And its use is attested by the Roman legions, who did quite a lot of uh, bleeding and uh, bloodletting themselves. The obvious implication um, in arming the magician with such a stone is that we are at risk of bloodshed through engaging in the operation. The influence of Mars as a malefic planet is, is uh, indicated here, and that as magicians, we are engaged in an act of transgression which will unleash a cosmic antagonism against us. We are trespassing. In Black Dragon, there is no bloodstone though it might be the stone suggested as an offering to Frymost. In the Livre Troisième, which Jake uses in his reconstruction of the true grimoire, the bloodstone is a critical component when you're commencing the work and embarking on any fresh pact. Bloodstone, in Greek, is heliotrope, meaning sun turning or sun following. Bloodstone, then, is literally the blood of the sun. In Greek, this is Titan's blood, and one Titan in particular, Prometheus. Prometheus, of course, is uh, an origin of Lucifer himself, 
and one of the first hints of the levels of antiquity that the grimoires preserve. The Christian version, imaginatively, is that the stone is the blood of Christ, um, which again makes this a powerful talisman if you're working in a Christian tradition. And uh, when wet, whether I can see the, the stone does look as if it is, uh, is covered in uh, fresh blood. With the bloodstone, we have three kingdoms combined. Animal in the red, vegetable in the green, and mineral in the stone itself. If it contains the virtues of the sun, then as a stone it can protect us from death, which is literally the loss of light. For a descent to the underworld, this would seem a vital talisman to have at hand, a lantern or a torch in the blackest of nights. In the Red Dragon, the stone is called Emati, which has caused some confusion amongst grimoire magicians who have variously suggested that you need to get a bloodstone and then baptize it as uh, Emati, um, when in fact this is simply a French phonetic spelling of uh, hematite that is literally bloodstone. The confusion only deepens when we realize that hematite is not bloodstone, but is in fact a lodestone whose properties make it a vital staple in magic, witchcraft, and hoodoo traditions. The confusion is because what the grimoires describe are properties, not fixed objects such as sticks, stones, or stars, and if we are to work with the grimoires, we must understand these shifting sympathies for the devil. As we find with the alchemical manuscripts, the meanings are subtle, they shift, and they are highly dependent on context. They are also riddled with errors, or, as I would suggest, layers of uh, fused historical strata. In order to understand the grimoires, we must liberate the way we think. If we can't do that, we'll never catch their meanings. But we must also be careful not to read the grimoires and to apply modern readings upon them, which are equally out of place. Pliny is uh, invaluable to the grimoire magician as his work is the source of many of the ideas that we find in Cornelius Agrippa and scattered throughout the grimoires and the lapidaries, the books of stones, which uh, in the Middle Ages elucidated the medicinal, the magical, and the sympathetical and allegorical qualities of gems. This is also a language that we find in books such as Revelations, where the construction of the New Jerusalem is described in terms of walls of Christ-like jasper and amethyst, and of course in the adornments of Our Lady Babylon of gold, pearls, and precious stones. This language of stones and gems has been very much neglected by modern magicians, probably due to the New Age associations. And I would like to suggest, as uh, Bob Dylan did, that everybody must get stones. I'm allowed to make bad jokes in this show. Even uh, when Pliny is writing, there's a lot of confusion already crept in, and he simply catalogues the material, um, leaving us with the task of shifting through it. In his natural history, he says of the bloodstone, if placed in a vessel of water and exposed to the full light of the sun, it changes to a reflected color like that of blood. And from this, we have the whole medical practice of placing bloodstone in a glass of water and then drinking the water to absorb the properties of the stone itself. This is one of the staples of magical medicine, which is also somewhat out of vogue. Um, we may also consider in this work that the blood staunching qualities of the uh, bloodstone will uh, prevent internal hemorrhages. So if you're engaging in a pact, um, it's kind of handy to keep a martini glass on the altar and uh, top it up with sunlight and bloodstone and drink the water as you're working. The water can also be used in another neglected magical act, that of hydromancy. Um, the art of divination by placing the bloodstone in a glass of water and scrying using the water. And again, a very important act for those who want to work with, uh, constrain with, or simply converse with spirits, which has been neglected in our modern age as people rush towards crystal bowls, or balls, crystal bowls, crystal balls, <laughs> and the uh, more macho triangle-based summoning rites. 
we can conjecture even further that folklore may refer to a previous precious stone which turned water blood red. And perhaps the best candidate for this would be red ochre, used in prehistory to heal wounds due to its antibiotic character, um, for medicine, and to paint both cave walls and skin. And I'd suggest that in using the bloodstone, we are reconnecting with this very early layer of magical history and strata. This use um, of red ochre is documented in Mesopotamia and Egypt, with uh, red ochre, of course, uh, related to Set. This red water may further suggest the red beer that Sekhmet drank, and even the hel henbane pilsner, or menstrual blood. But as with all good homeopathy, there may be no scientifically discernible trace of that in the grimoires. Pliny continues, in the use of the stone, we have the most glaring illustration of the impudent effrontery of the adepts. See, we were, we were popular then as well. <laughs> For they say that if combined with the plant heliotropum and certain incarnation, incantations are repeated over it, it will render the person invisible who carries it upon them. Now, this is a, a good lesson in magical sympathies with both plant, stone, and spoken word being used to create a spell. The plants that he refers to is Heliotropum europaeum, which is again said to turn and follow the sun in its course through the day. Ovid, in his Metamorphosis, provides the etiology, telling us that the plant is the transformed nymph Clyte, who uh, has been rather struck by Apollo and follows him through the day looking at him, and uh, he doesn't notice her. So just as uh, the nymph was not seen by Apollo, if we work with that plant, then we'll also be granted invisibility under the light of the sun. So any time that we look at working with plants, um, it's essential to look at the folklore and the properties and observe how a plant is in its natural environment, and from that begin to understand what it can do for us. Both Dante in his poetry and uh, Boccaccio in prose and the Decameron talk about the use of bloodstone for procuring exactly this power, invisibility. And thus the chain of sympathies extends from before Pliny, through the Middle Ages, through the grimoires, and right down to magical practitioners today. Now, invisibility is of course a shamanic power and one that every magician should cultivate when engaged in these kind of Promethean endeavors. For more on invisibility in the classical world, um, I'd again recommend looking at Jake Stratton Kent's Geosophia. If you are venturing into the underworld or the void, it's kind of handy to be able to disappear as there are things which are bigger and uglier than I think most of you. Um, hiding, merging, melding, shape-shifting, these are all vital magical powers. Um, and an important part of what we find in, in early hunting magic. And make no mistake, all those who are seeking power hunt. And we are not always the apex predator. Bloodstone is part of a wider class of stones, um, green stones that Pliny calls smargadus and it would be equally apt to carry an emerald, a moldavite, or a malachite. Yet the grimoires are aimed squarely at the folk practitioner, so the, the emeralds might be a bit out of reach. Um, if you were, want to work with Lucifer seriously, the expense might be required, and uh, Livre Troisième suggests um, an engraved emerald or ruby would be suitable. And again, engraving on stones is one of those magical craft secrets that's somewhat outside our current magical use and should be returned. So in short, the bloodstone is, uh, is the pentacle of the work. It's a lucky stone, it's a keep safe, it's an object in the environment that's made us stop and realize that it contains power, that we've glimpsed something other in this particular stone, whether it's meteorite or magical or magnetic. This is the awareness we must have as magicians. With the stone, we write the holy names in the dirt and the crossroads for the right. And again, we should pause and think about the antiquity of this magical act, the act of 
drawing on the earth with a stone, which can reconnect us to the very earliest acts of magic that man has ever performed, and back to that very dawn of human consciousness that we may wish to call Lucifer. Armed with our stone, we now need to create a wand or blasting rod, and a straight wand, a forked stick, and a stang are variously suggested in the grimoires. All the texts insist that this is fashioned from hazel, being the wood of divination, and this clearly marks it out as a European pagan survival, pure and simple. Hazel has been used for divination since time immemorial, and it's clearly chthonic in that it divines what is hidden in the earth. In the grimoires, a hazel wand is used because the spirit we are summoning is concerned with buried treasure, and this means physical gold, and not spiritual riches, as some fanciful modern readings suggest. The grimoires are, above all, pragmatic. They are not some inverse, cabalistic labyrinth. They were written largely to order, cut and pasted, in the midst of a treasure-hunting mania. And spirits guard treasure. They are gnomic. They are ancestors. And with the advent of Christianity, were cast as increasingly infernal. On one level, in preparing to make the pact, we are taking precautions before we rob and desecrate the graves and barrows of our forgotten pagan dead. We are very much at risk in this realm of fairy. The red dragon has the most satanic appearing version of procuring the wand, and this requires the sacrifice of a goat at a deserted crossroads. So today, in politically correct fashion, we're going to talk about that. We buy a kid, internet users, please note, this is not a real kid, this is a baby goat. We buy a kid, which we garland with vervain, and when garlanded with vervain, we tie a green ribbon around its throat. The green ribbon, like the green of the bloodstone, is the colour of life, which will soon be joined with the redness of blood. We kindle a fire with white wood, as we need the fire to burn hot. If you're working with the black dragon, you may also want to use the blessed charcoal made from boxwood. And in the fashion of magicians, everywhere. This is as far as the striptease goes today. We roll up our uh, shoulder to the uh, elbow, shoulder, roll up our sleeve to the shoulder, and then uh, taking a knife, we cut the throat of the goat with one movement. The true grimoire suggests that the knife can sever the goat's head with one blow, with one stroke. In the key of Solomon, the goat is turned on its back so that it gazes at the heavens when we perform the same sacrifice, this time in order to procure the magical parchment. Surely this is the height of black magic, a deserted crossroads, a goat sacrifice. So far, so Dennis Wheatley. However, what is more likely is that this cutting of the throat, windpipe, and arteries is what we find in Shechita. Apologies to any people who've actually practiced Judaism. This is the ritual Judaic offering of, uh, offering of uh, meat. This is the sacrifice which was made at the temple to Jehovah. The sacrifice we're performing is not the pagan chthonic offering that we find in Homer to draw forth the ghosts of the dead. We are cutting the goat's throat because the blood is taboo. As we read in Deuteronomy 12, 23, only be sure that thou eat not the blood, for the blood is the life, and thou may not eat, may not, mayest not eat the life with the flesh. What we are performing as magicians is a compassionate act of sacrifice, not one of satanic sadism, but straight out of Deuteronomy and Leviticus, an offering of herdsmen, and no more shocking than that. The new knife which we use to cut the throat of the goat, again we find in Judaism, where the risk is that the knife may have previously been used when making offerings to idols. As magicians, we then flay the skin from the kid and the body is burnt to ashes, which you then throw at the rising sun. 
this most diabolic, this most infamous act is simply Jewish temple ritual. So we stand at the crossroads, holding the flayed skin of the beast, and we leave the burning ground with the, with the blade of the knife still bloody, very important. And with this bloody knife, we sally forth the next morning and uh, we cut the hazel wand again with the rising sun. So is our grimoire tradition simply garbled Judaism with the wand as a small Satan that we have triumphed over and can torture in the flames to gain dominance over the spirits that we summon? Is this really a proper way to make a pact with Lucifer? Or perhaps we can extract another version of the ritual from the fire. Let's look at the clear pagan elements here. Vervain is a vital magical plant in the ancient pagan world. Particularly, vervain was notable in its use for the tempering of steel, and thus the mysteries of Smithcraft and Cain, who we work with not through the horseman's word, but through the spirit Caim in the Goetia, who's a sword-forging spirit. This use of the crown of vervain or a plant is of extremely ancient origin. And again, as this is the summer of love, I am suggesting seriously that we all wear flowers in our hair. We crown ourselves, the goat, and our assistants with the vervain and the green ribbon. In this sense, we are all identified as the sacrificial victim. We are the sacrifice in a shamanic rite of dismemberment, a trick, a sleight of hand. We are unlocking the underworld with the blood key whilst disguised as the virile spirit of the goat. It seems highly likely that uh, in earlier times a goat's head would also have been worn as the original headdress, or at the very least, its divine spiralling horns. In fact, there is no need for the animal at all. We can offer our own blood instead. Again, this is something very important for men to do, and most of the grimoire rituals are written for men, as women have their own blood mysteries. To state clearly, again, for the internet generation, it would be inappropriate and stupid for alienated modern urban man to attempt to offer a hooved animal in this way. The skin which is removed can be a drum skin, a parchment for drawing the seal on, as we find in the Grimorian Verum, or perhaps another way to think about the mystery of the initiatory acts of tattooing. In the grimoire, something quite particular is done. The flayed skin is cut into strips, and these strips of goat skin are used to lay out our ritual circle. So, as magicians, surrounded by a circle of goat skin, we are literally within the skin of the beast. As surely as Bujalud is sewn into the animal hide in Jujuka and rampages as Pan, we are doing a ritual of animal transformation. This is shamanism with the bloodstone as the secret stone, gem, crystal, or bone that reanimates our corpse. The circle is fixed with four nails at the quarters, taken ominously in the grimoires from the coffin of a dead child. These nails are the fixed stars, the elemental spirits, the solstice and equinox, and navigation in the other world so our spirit does not become lost. The crossroads are the directions we can travel in and the spirit roads that lead back to us. We light virgin candles. We burn brandy and camphor. We get wild. We get scared enough for the adrenaline to flow. We call and we dance. Our wand is the spirit of the animal. It is forked, horned, and affixed to its tips are metal points from the smelted down and magnetized body of the still bloody sacrificial knife. Here is the hematite lodestone again. The wand has become a living fetish. It will draw us to the places of power in the earth and will critically draw the spirits to us. 
it twitches alive in the grasp of the Tellurian currents. Here we confess our transgressions and our sins. We have killed an animal and brother. We have worked with metal. We have raped our mother earth. In short, we have left the world of animals, left the world of magic, and become men. We've sought to sever this connection, to disguise our appetites with civilized words, our lusts with clothing, and so there must always be a reckoning, a restoration of the cosmic balance. And this is the role of the shaman who sacrifices his humanity to become more than human. So we demand our audience with spirit, with the Lord of animals, whose children we have slain as hunters and enslaved as agriculturalists. In the guise of goats, we tread on cloven hooves back to our father for forgiveness, to Lucifer, who taught us these self-same sins. We throw him a pure gold or silver coin in payment for our blood guilt and the pact is struck. When the grimoires describe the spirit who comes, they describe him in different ways. In Red Dragon, Lucifer sends his vice-regent, Lucifer Rofficale, to the carcist. I take issue with the entire idea of Lucifugum as the light fleeing class of demons that Michael Sellis proposes in his 11th century work, De Operation Demonum, but that's a bigger discussion. For today, it's simply worth noting that though you may call Lucifer, it is more likely that you will get a spirit more appropriate lower down the listing. When we look at the small character study illustrations in The Red Dragon, Lucifer appears ass-eared, reminding us of the cap of ass's ears worn at the Feast of Fools in an inversion of order that dates back to the Roman Saturnalia and continued right through to the 16th century. But it's the full portrait which should draw our real attention. The spirit we call wears an outrageous collar and a shirt that ends in tatters and ribbons. He is hooved and in a horned headdress. The number of horns vary, and it's not impossible that these are in fact antlers, and there is a final vestige of the deer cult of Northern Europe and Scandinavia before it was written over by the goatish opposer we find in Byzantine Christianity. What is clear is that the spirit that comes is not an ordinary animal, and it is not an ordinary man. We encounter a similar therianthrope in that other grimoire favourite, the right of the black hen, <coughs> again tasselled and flamboyantly dressed, with a tail peeking out from his breeches or animal haunches. This therianthrope would be just at, just at home on the pages of, uh, on the walls of Lascaux, as on the pages of the Bibliotheque Bleu grimoires. This is a spirit that we're glimpsing skin switching between the age of magic and the age of reason. With his blackened face, we are reminded of the geysers and mummers and morris men whose pagan forebears would blacken their faces into anonymity, becoming invisible, becoming no one, becoming no man, before performing that most taboo act of all, the contrition of human sacrifice. If you want to talk about lineage, this ritual and animal masking goes back to the Upper Paleolithic in Europe, over 30,000 years of human history. The spirit you encounter carries a horn of plenty or a leather bag full of gold that is remarkably replenished. This cornucopia is the broken horn of the goat Amalfi that Zeus was sustained by as he hid from Kronos in the Idian cave. This is the sack we see borne by the horned fool in the uh, tarot card. Furthermore, over the shoulder of this figure, 
is slung a serpent, a circle, a hoop, or a drum. In all of the pictures, it appears that the illustrator isn't quite sure what he's drawing. However, the costume worn by the spirit is exactly that worn by shaman in traditional societies. And I use the word shaman with precision as this tasseled costume is what was and is worn in Siberia. This Lucifer then seems to be nothing more and nothing less than a mirror image of the magician himself. Perhaps here in the circle, the magician is encountering an ancestor that with our forked stick that is both serpent, goat, and lightning, and with our magic stone and our flayed hide, we have conjured the lord of the animals, first thrown by the flicker of the fire against the cave walls in our mimicry that is the dance of transformation. Thus the grimoires open up, not to the bottomless pits of hell, but to ancestry, underworld, and understanding. Hail Lucifer. Thank you.